a fond greeting to Sharon. Hello, Sharon. And uh, Tony Murata. Tony, is your wife there also? All right. Hi, Heather. She's not there. Good. Yeah. All right. Tonight, we're going to take a journey together. We're going to have a little fun in the sense of we're going to uh, go over what we've covered one more time, but we're going to do it in a completely different way than we have the other times. The other times up to this point, we've gone through chapter 1, 2, and 3. It's primarily been about the wisdom of God as seen at the cross, Christ crucified. The wisdom and the power of God seen uh, as the weakness of God, Christ crucified, the weakness of God. And therefore, to declare him as the Messiah, the foolishness of God, to declare him as anything other than a reprobate criminal uh, would, be to, would be foolishness. And so let's uh, go to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter first, and we'll refresh just for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's just read uh, 21 through 25. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. <coughs> but we preach Christ crucified. And right there you'll notice that there is pressure from several different parties. One wants you to preach the signs. The other one wants you to preach great in, in a great uh, oratory with much wisdom. <clears throat> and Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified. Okay. So he's literally going against the trends and norms of his day to preach Christ crucified. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Gentiles foolishness, which let's just consider this now. If you're trying to reach the world with the truth of Christ crucified, why, or with a message, why pick Christ crucified? Because clearly it's uh, foolishness uh, um, and a stumbling block. I mean, think about it now. If your goal was to reach the whole world with your message, don't pick something that basically to the two main groups that you're dealing with, it's either a stumbling block or foolishness, right? I mean, go, in other words, go get you a popular message. Unless, of course, this is the message that God has called you to preach, okay? But unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, and remember, he's still talking about the cross and Christ crucified, uh, from verse 18 all the way down, actually before that, 17 and down. <clears throat> um, but we, but unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God God in his weakest point is stronger than men. All right. So this is, this is the theme of Corinthians. This has been the theme that we've touched on. But what we've done so far this, in this course is, in the first three chapters, we've really done what Paul did. We have gone through this and we have given this in more or less a theological point of view an instructional point of view, a teaching point of view, a point of view in relationship to truth and reality 
therefore how you perceive it in your head and in your heart. <clears throat> but tonight, and however long it takes me to do this, I want to take it out of that context now because you should know that context to some degree that we, of, of what chapter one is, of what chapter two is dealing with, what chapter three is dealing with. You should know that to some degree. And I want to put it now in a historical con context, a context of how, how life was and what was going on around this situation. So it wasn't, it wasn't just theology. There was actual real things happening and they were, they were working through all of this at the same time that this was being worked in there. And it's important to see that. What I'm gonna do, because um, I, I greatly desire to get beyond chapter one, two, and three, what I want to do is I am going to try to pretty much just read this because it is a story. It's taken me weeks of work, many six, eight hours and more a day working on this. Um, and it is chock full of scriptures, but I'm not going to read all of the scriptures. But if you need any of the scriptures, I'll let you have them, but there are there's a ton of them here. So I'm just going to proceed. Of course, as I usually do, I'll make comments, but I will try my best uh, because it is a storyline. It should be easily to follow. And because it is a storyline, if I break this thing up too long, like four set, you know what I mean, you're going to lose the, the flow of the story. Okay. So I, I felt led of God, I feel led of God to just present it the way that I'm going to do it tonight, okay? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> to understand Paul's explanations of the wisdom of God and his commitment to it, the wisdom of God being Christ crucified, you have to go back before the time that he met Jesus. At that time, Paul was known as Saul of Tarsus. Okay, that was his name. <clears throat> He was a Pharisee who had been trained in Jerusalem and had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the greatest rabbinical teacher of that era. While in training, he had outdistanced all others who were becoming Pharisees. And again, I have scriptures on all of this. Around that same time, John the Baptist began his ministry of preaching and of baptizing. His primary message was that he was the forerunner of the Messiah, and therefore that stirred a lot of stuff, right? just claiming you're the forerunner of the Messiah, it just stirred the pot. Um, his, his primary message was, was that he was the forerunner of the Messiah to prepare his way. This was good news to the Jews who had been waiting for centuries for his coming. At that time, the nation of Israel was under the brutal rule of Rome and wanted deliverance. Much of the people and many Pharisees went out to the Jordan River to see John the Baptist and to ask him questions. Now, I'm sure you remember in scriptures as they came out and they, <clears throat> they did all of this. Uh, we do not know if Saul of Tarsus did also, but we know that John's message concerning the imminent appearing of the Messiah was talked about by everybody and Saul would have known about it. And I've got several, three different references and three different books on that. Soon Jesus appeared for a period of about three years. <clears throat> there was much suspicion from the religious leadership because he was simply a carpenter's son from one of the worst cities around, Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <clears throat> In general, the religious community did not believe that he was the Messiah. They didn't believe it, okay, and they didn't, they didn't embrace him. This clearly included Saul of Tarsus, though we have no record of him ever going out to see Jesus during his ministry years. At the end of three years, at the end of three years ministry, the next headline news everyone heard concerning this Jesus movement was that their leader had been put to death on a Roman cross. Okay. While that was good news among the, the priests and Pharisees, soon they became confronted with a new level of disturbance concerning this false Christ. False Christ. His followers were not 
only not in the process of disbanding, but we're now spreading an incredulous story that this cursed and defeated criminal had been raised from the dead by God and had now become the Messiah that Israel had long waited for. I mean, that's just incredible to, you know, what kind of, st what is this? We thought it was done. <clears throat> this became too much for Saul of Tarsus. <clears throat> Whatever lack of involvement he might have had before this time, he would make up for. <laughs> Saul sets out to destroy the early Jesus movement single-handedly by gaining authority from the high priest and religious leaders in order that he might stamp out the movement. And, you know, it would be good if I just read a couple of scriptures here so that you can really get this feel of this guy, Saul of Tarsus who would later become Paul. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> because these scriptures that I'm going to read are going to clue you into his stand about the wisdom of God compared to the wisdom of man. Okay? We'll... we'll We'll show that as we go here. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Okay, that's, that would scare you right there. I mean, he was breathing it out. He wasn't, you know, with every breath, he's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Okay, so that's, that's starting to give you a little picture of what he was like. Uh, we'll read some more in Acts in just a minute. He brought many uh, to, to prison and even had some killed. So let's flip back to Acts 7. Acts chapter 7. In the last, let's see, not the last verse. Yeah. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, what? 58. Yeah, verse 58. Um, and cast him out, out of the city and stoned him, talking about stoning that the people rose up against Stephen and stoned him, and the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now drop down to chapter 8, which is just a few verses down, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Okay, so that right there, that's an amazing thing because Saul, now we know Paul, who we're talking about the same man, Paul was an incredible missionary who spread the gospel around the world. But Saul did too, but not willingly. But when he started this persecution, they were scattered. And they, everywhere they went, they started sharing Jesus. Okay, and so verse 3 of uh, chapter, Acts 8, and as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and, and hauling men and women, uh, com I'm sorry, what? Hailing. Hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Okay, so okay, make, he made havoc of the church. So this guy was out of control with the wisdom of this age. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> if there ever was a man who knew how to wield the sword of power and terrorization, it was Saul of Tarsus. He was well-versed in climbing over many my own brethren in the Jews' religion, Galatians 1.14. Listen to his own words concerning his use of the wisdom of man in gaining the upper hand over these Jesus freaks. Acts chapter 26. And this is him telling his own story here. <clears throat> Acts chapter 26 and verse 10 and 11.
In fact, you could go to verse uh, 9. I verily thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I did, I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them often in every, in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. Compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under foreign cities. All right, so what you're getting here is a, that's his own words. All right, I mean, other people can tell you stuff. But this is Saul of Tarsus, Paul telling you what he was like before he met Jesus. <clears throat> All right. So I want to talk about Paul's experience of Christ crucified. Can you see how important all this is to his words, what he's saying in 1 Corinthians? He's talking about the wisdom of, of God through weakness. You're getting a good background on this guy and what he was like before he met Jesus. <clears throat> All right, and what we're going to go over now is his experience of Christ crucified. But one day everything changed. How? It all changed when Saul of Tarsus became confronted on the road to Damascus with this crucified, defeated one who was now raised by God. <clears throat> Just as Thomas saw the scars in the hands and feet of the risen Messiah, one must wonder if Saul of Tarsus did also. Remember, this man was not just a sinner in the general sense of the word. He was an out-and-out -out enemy of Jesus and his followers. Okay? I mean, can you see that? He wasn't just sin. He wasn't, you know, you know, doing sinful things. He was dedicated to the destruction of the church. All right? Um, he had... He had used all his resources to destroy the church. The book of Acts lays bare the vitality of the violence with which he attacked those who turned from the Jews' religion unto following Jesus. After his conversion, even he had, uh, after his, uh, his conversion, even he admits it in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, where he states, I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, folks, that stayed with this man forever. He, he refers to it often throughout. And there's more to it than what we really realize here. We, we look at that as a sin. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it here. <clears throat> Therefore, it can be understood how one of the greatest shocks to the early Christian church came when it was found out that he who persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. That's Galatians 1.23. You might have even heard one, of, uh, one whose family had been greatly persecuted and injured by Saul say to another brother, Why would God save such a man? He deserved hell for eternity. <clears throat> News spread quickly that Saul of Tarsus had been converted on the road to Damascus. But perhaps the greatest shock of all came to the newly converted Saul. God had allowed something to happen that was completely foreign to the mind of a Pharisee. This persecutor had now been accepted in not just as a disciple, but as one of God's apostles. That is mind-blowing to the Jews' religion and to the Pharisee, where you have to earn everything. At the height of his resistance to Jesus, and at his worst possible point in not being what God wanted him to be, God calls him to the highest position. Saul's discovery of God's method of salvation by means of the death of his own son, along with his timing of loving him at his worst possible point, 
were diametric, diametrically opposed to the way of the law based on earning God's love and favor. It's like, you don't, I mean, if he was just a sinner, he would come, oh, and no, oh, thank you. But he wasn't just a sinner. He was breathing out threatenings. He was wreaking havoc on the church. He was against Jesus, and Jesus calls him to be an apostle. Now, all of this, folks, formed the man that we're, we've been reading about in Corinthians and Philippians and all of this. This is where his, his formative reality started coming from. Based upon Christ's death for an acceptance of one who had so vehemently attacked the church, Saul interprets the events of the cross as a self-sacrificing love that is the supreme demonstration of the true nature of God. That the cross, this is what he started coming to, that this is the supreme demonstration of the true nature of God. What is? Christ crucified, Christ crucified. He sees the love of God as giving its highest and best, his son, God's son, to suffer the pains and indignities deserving to the worst criminals, himself, in order to raise up and honor and justify what least deserves any honor. It's called justification, by the way. <laughs> he describes this in Romans 5, 6 through 10, as God proving his love by dying on behalf of enemies, the ungodly, and sinners. He uses all three of those words there in Romans 5. He further interprets Christ crucified as the way those who are joined unto him are to relate to and cover one another. Quoting Romans 15, 7, Receive ye one another, even as Christ also received you. In what way did Christ receive us? He did so by dying on our behalf, the just for the unjust. Okay? <clears throat> this personal way Saul of Tarsus experienced Christ crucified, not just on the road to Damascus, the way he experienced Christ crucified, you see. He met Jesus on the but he began to experience this reality in his being. <clears throat> um, had a profound effect on him. Because of, this hor of how, because of his horrid acts that took place before his conversion against the Messiah's own body, he forever saw himself as the least and one who was not fit to be called an apostle in that he should be the last one that God should call to such an honor. 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 9. His conclusion is that since he <clears throat> deserved none of this, then I am what I am by the grace of God because he's, he, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this. But he's talking about, see, we quote that verse, I am what I am by the grace of God, but he is, he means it because in that same, ver, in those same verses right there, he's talking about, I persecuted the church and I'm the least one who deserves this. But I am what I am. In other words, he didn't see one ounce of merit in himself. Nothing worthy of being where he was. And he didn't just walk off saying, well, this is grace the way we do. He looked deeply into the cross, and there he began to discover God, the nature of God, the way of God. <clears throat> All right. Also in Romans 1, 5, he links his apostleship on the basis of this grace. This experience caused Paul not just to change his doctrines founded on Judaism to that of Christianity, but to come to a completely different conclusion concerning God himself and what the cross stood for. He no longer saw the death of Jesus on the cross as a fool's errand carried out by a cursed criminal who deserved his fate. In light of his experience of Christ, 
of his experience of Christ crucified, he saw Christ crucified as the power in weakness of God, whereby God is revealed through selfless giving. He came to see the God revealed in Christ's cross. That's what he, that's what he saw. See. And why? Because he wasn't searching for a doctrine. He wasn't seeking, you know, what's the wisdom of God and what's the wisdom of man. He was the wisdom of man. And every thought and every way that he proceeded was to gain his own upper hand, to gain the, 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 the strength, the position of strength, like the Romans, you know. That was everything that he did. And now he's been met by this guy who was cursed, and he was a Pharisee, and he couldn't believe that they would have the audacity to talk about that God raised that one. How foolish is that? And yet the foolishness of God all of a sudden comes to him. How foolish would it be to save the worst against his own person, his own body? And not only save them, put them up there with the other 12. <laughs> the, other, the others that walked with Jesus. <clears throat> To truly understand the magnitude of the effect that Christ crucified had on this proud Pharisee, one must understand that Saul was not simply changed from being a rank sinner into a righteous person. Consider Philippians 3, 5 through 6. And there he's, he talks about what things were gained to me, I count loss for Christ. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee concerning the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, I count loss. And we'll, we'll see that here in a minute. He perceived his standing under the law to be blameless. That's pretty good standing compared to many who receive Christ today. Some who regularly sin, do drugs, or generally live contrary to the revealed will of God. Meaning, I'm a sinner, you know. Paul, in his own mind, was a good man, was one of the best men. He met something that was altogether different, Christ crucified. It was other. <clears throat> but Saul of Tarsus was in the top of his class among those who pursued God according to the law. So what did the conversion of Saul involve? He was transformed from being righteous based on his own goodness to becoming a vessel of the life and nature of Christ crucified. That, that was his transformation. He was transformed from being righteous in his own right to becoming a vessel of the message and of the life of Christ crucified. <clears throat> It was no idle platitude. Uh, it was no idle platitude with this uh, converted Pharisee when he said in 1 Corinthians 1:31, "He that boasts, let him boast in the Lord." Amen. For in Philippians 3, he takes all the fine religious qualities that he once boasted in and flushes them down the toilet, counting them as dung. Why? He did so because he was in pursuit after God that would bring him into conformity with Jesus' death. Philippians 3.10. So he said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. But what I want to conform to is his death. Amen. Knowledge, knowledge, life. How you proceed. The revelation of Christ crucified as seen by him came into contrast with all the ways he had previously operated and with all the methods he had considered correct concerning how to deal with opposition. Now come on, think of this. Think of the circumstances. This man, before he knew Jesus, he used every ounce of power. He used every ounce of force to get his way. He stood up for what was right, and he didn't see anything wrong with using all this kind of stuff until 
He saw the victory of God in Jesus at the cross. <clears throat> but you also have to see that this shattered, shattered. I mean, that's why, that's why he's talking the way he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. It shattered any um, view of those methods that were his methods, that were him, that shattered them. And now he says, I am determined not to know anything but Christ and him crucified. And he, he throws off himself. He doesn't just say, oh, I think I'll change doctrines. Oh, I think I'll agree with that, that there new creation teaching or something foolish, you know, something ridiculous like that. No. He was the contrast to Jesus. And he said, you know, I like that better. I like the way that looks a lot better than I like what I see in the mirror. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let's see. The revelation of Christ crucified as seen by him came into contrast with all the ways he had previously operated and with all of the methods he had considered correct concerning how to deal with opposition. Okay. All right, so now let's start applying this to the ministry of Paul. <clears throat> Soon Saul changed his name to Paul, which means small. Paul means small. This might be an early indication of his embrace of the weakness and foolishness of God as seen in Christ crucified. Paul was a Roman name, which would have put him out of good graces with the Hebrew world, with the Jews. But by taking that name, that would have automatically made him an offense. <clears throat> Added to that, he was no longer of Tarsus, but he had become a citizen of a new country. He had become an ambassador and an apostle for Jesus and, him, and his crucified way. The definition of, a, of an apostle is one sent with a message because he stands in the stead of the sender and comes by the authority of the one who sent him. <laughs> he, he's totally sold out. I mean, he's, he, he's just, you know, it's, it's like the example of, of David and Jonathan. And Jonathan is, I won't even say his name because it might confuse some of you, but his father was king. <laughs> and, and he was in line to be king and to have all power and everything else. And David's on the run and David's fixing to have to go run and hide from his life, from, his, from Jonathan's father. And... Jonathan strips himself of his sword and he gives it to David and strips himself of everything that would give him honor and make him something and said, no, you are supposed to be king. And he was. He represented Christ. He was. And we were usurping our authority and our power and using it for our own benefit. And even if we did good things from time to time, the, even that was so that we would appear better. So that, you know, I mean, you know, the mafia leaders used to be really good in their neighborhood. They'd give money to little kids and give help people and buy groceries for the poor and do all this, and all the neighborhood loved them, even though they were murdering people and everything else. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. In other words, Paul was sold out to his new master along with his way, his new way of viewing things based on the foolishness of the crucifixion of God, Jesus. The foolishness of the crucifixion of God. Was Jesus God? The foolish, you have to, you have to let that register. The foolishness that God would be crucified? Uh, he would not know anything among the people to whom he ministered except Christ and him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. However, however, Paul is not satisfied to leave it there. He then sets out to reach the whole of the known world of his day in order to bring them into what he f has found concerning Christ crucified. Even while traveling, he sends out letters to the various churches raised up by him and exhorts them... Uh, Onward into the wisdom of God is known by the cross, which 
our letter that we're, discover, we're searching on, 1 Corinthians, is one of those. Um, but unlike his Pharisaical ways of the past, he does not demand unswerving obedience to uh, his exhortations in his letters, but simply says, and this is 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me, showing that his first purpose is to demonstrate the crucified life, because he, he goes on to say, even as I imitate Christ. And he's talking about Christ crucified there. Showing that his first purpose is to demonstrate the crucified life as his own, with hope that others will see the wisdom of God in it and follow Christ crucified with him. All is led to his letter to the Corinthians many years later. Previous to writing that letter, Paul had come and brought most of the Corinthians to their first introduction to the reality of Christ crucified, right? Paul was the one who raised that. He was the first one there. After he left the area of Corinth, problems arose which demanded the need for the apostle to write the letter of 1 Corinthians in order to deal with the issues. Apparently, the Corinthians had chosen up sides concerning who would be their leader of choice, thereby making their boast in certain men based on preferential qualities rather than boasting in Christ crucified. Does that sound familiar? Because that's what we've been reading and studying now. But now you see the context of all of this. Now you see Paul in the middle of all of this and where he's at and why he's saying what he's saying. <clears throat> the phrase that best identify, identifies the divisions among the Corinthians is, I am of. Some said, I am of Cephas, others said, I am of Apollos, or even, I am of Paul. By hearing some say, I am of Paul, he immediately passes over the opportunity for honor, for gain of a following, and for glory as a man of God, because he only boasts in Christ crucified as his way of proceeding. I mean, come on, folks. If you were in the midst of something like that, and somebody said, I am of, and they mentioned your name, you'd kind of go, well, this is, you know. Maybe I need to cultivate this following. <laughs> Paul refutes the whole thing, all of it, including his own. And he says, look, Christ crucified is what we should be boasting in. You sh we should be determined not to know anything among us but Christ crucified. <laughs> <clears throat> He would basically say unto them, don't say I am a Paul, only imitate me because I am a copy of Christ crucified and a servant or slave to those who belong to him and am not their head or Lord. I've got a bunch of scriptures that I used to make that statement, but that's what he said in Corinthians. In fact, he sets out to prove that these other men of esteem, such as Apollos or Peter, are to be as slaves also. His goal is to take all men out of their higher places of honor by placing Christ crucified above all else. He wants them to see that we should not aim at becoming individual ministries seeking to gain status among God's people, but we are to function as part of the one new man, Christ. As such, all comes from him through us. So for Paul, the question is not, who were you baptized by? But who were you baptized into? Because if you're baptized into Christ, you're one with Christ. And you were also baptized into his death. So they're making, they're getting all wrapped up in these acts of some, well, he baptized so-and-so, and he, well, he baptized this many people. And he said, but his was more prominent people in the church. Well, but, you know, who did Paul baptize? And the only thing that matters is who were you baptized into because if you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death. And so we need to stop all of that. That's basically what's going on here. <clears throat> his goal is to, um, let's see. <clears throat> the apostle's purpose is to preach the person, Christ crucified, and not just who can do the most or the greatest amount of good in his name, such as baptizing people. As far as Paul is concerned, if the Corinthians receive the word of the cross, described by him as the power and weakness of God, 
then that will resolve all the issues of personal and ministerial differences that have led to divisions within their gathering. One of Paul's methods for bringing these believers back to the original message that they received concerning Christ crucified is to point them back to the cross. Okay, so we want to look at, we want to just take a little bit of look at some of the theological things in the light of what we're talking about now. One, Paul, Paul is this apostle that raised up this church. He's, he's writing to them to get them back on track. He's going to approach this task from several different angles. Okay. Not just one. He's going to come at this from several different angles. One of Paul's methods for bringing these believers back to the original message that they received concerning Christ crucified is simply to point them back to the cross first. Okay. In so doing, he refers them back to God's calling. Okay. What is the meaning of the word calling and called in verses 18, 26, and 27? Well, if, if, let's look at it in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. So there's part of the calling right there, but unto us who are saved, we have been called unto salvation. It, re it first refers to those who are called unto Christ crucified as the way of redemption. first and starting point is Christ crucified as the way of redemption. He wants them to recall their first comprehension of God's wisdom and power dis displayed at the cross in terms of weakness and foolishness. Just do it apart from you, he's saying. Don't look at you. Let's just look at Jesus now and see if this is first true of Jesus. <clears throat> uh, salvation by Christ crucified is their beginning point in the calling of God. However, once that has taken place, those who are called to salvation by Christ crucified are to eventually see the pattern at the cross and to see that pattern as their calling also. Okay, and that's, uh, um, let's see. Verse 24, but unto them who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ crucified again is the power and wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And also, let's see, let me see if this is a correct scripture. Well, I don't want to use that one. We'll just stay right there because we're going to use some more here in these scriptures in just a minute. All right. So what he's saying is I want you to see in Jesus at the cross, the weakness of God and the foolishness of God as being the power and the wisdom by which everything changed spiritually. Okay? But then he says, once that has taken place, those who are called to salvation by Christ crucified are to eventually see the pattern at the cross and to see that pattern as their calling also. In so doing, he is seeking to get them to re-embrace the hidden wisdom of God, a wisdom that was best seen in Christ crucified. However, Paul also wants these Corinthians to be able to identify those who are in opposition to this kind of wisdom, those having the wisdom of this world that will persecute the hidden wisdom of God. Because he's dealing with issues. He's dealing with people and people are, are functioning by a wisdom that is setting, is putting some people down and lifting up other people and putting some people down thinking that lifts them up and operating in this manner. And so that's why I wrote, however, Paul also wants these Corinthians to be able to identify those who are in opposition to this kind of wisdom, those having the wisdom of this world that will persecute the hidden wisdom of God. 
He desires the Corinthians to see that there are those among them who seek to make what Paul preaches be seen as foolishness, yet this is God's mean of, means of victory and power. That means that there are people actively working in the Corinthian church to make Paul look foolish and what Paul preaches foolish. Well, you know, this guy preaches nothing but the cross. This guy's always, he's talking about weakness. You know, this is, you know, don't listen to Paul. Be of so-and-so. They don't mention it so much. Okay. He also wants them to notice that the cross makes foolish the wisdom of this world. And therefore, the approach that these men have taken, uh, and their, let's see, he also wants them to notice that the cross makes foolish the wisdom of this world, and therefore makes foolish the approach that these men have taken. In what way does he, he make this known? He shows how through this shameful, inglorious death, all enemies are defeated. Sin, the world, the old man, the law. So in light of that fact, he asks, where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? What is the word disputer of this age basically referring to? Where are the Greek philosophers? Where are those with all this oratory and ability to put down the cross when it is the very thing. In fact, I, let's see. How do they respond to the fact that when they, scorn, when they scorn as failure, how do they respond to the fact that when they scorn as failure, stupidity and foolishness has become the means for defeating all enemies which their philosophies only danced around having no real or permanent answer. All right. So there's they are scorning the preaching of the cross and the emphasis of Paul and Paul. And they're scorning it as um, foolishness, as stupidity, as failure. And yet Paul says it has become the means for defeating all enemies. Wherefore, where are the disputers, you know? Their philosophies have only danced around the truth and danced around the facts, and they have given no real permanent answers because everyone's still struggling with the same thing. <laughs> all right. Time to take a drink here. I feel like I'm just reading. <laughs> Having finished addressing those at Corinth based on that approach, he now turns to a new tactic. His new angle from which he addresses them will be based on the status of the Corinthians themselves. Okay. So he's pointing to the cross. He's saying, foolishness, Weakness, but that's God's wisdom and power. Now he's going to point to the Corinthians and say the same thing. <clears throat> this new angle from which he addresses, uh, addresses them will be based on the status of the Corinthians themselves. The makeup of the church at Corinth proves Paul's very point concerning the nature of God's wisdom. In light of the traditional view of the wisdom of God as espoused by Judaism, the Corinthian church was made up of idol worshipers, pagans, and debased human beings of every sort. On God's part, there was nothing in them over which to take pride in. Right? The Corinthian, have you ever read? Do you remember Paul went to Corinth and he just got sick standing there watching everything? <laughs> you know? Um, There, there were not many noble or wise in their midst. Surely the godly Jews in the local synagogue looked down upon them and thought that it was ridiculous for them to think that God would ever accept them, right? Isn't that true? That the Jews 
and the synagogue said, don't follow these, this Jesus movement. These people are crazy. You're messed up. <laughs> so, just as the wisdom of this world rejects Christ crucified because of its shame and foolish appearance, even so that same wisdom, if applied to them, would find them also being rejected. They looked at Jesus and they said, there's a criminal. He's a reject. He's hanging between two thieves. Everyone's turned against him. He's not the Messiah. This can't be God. This cross ain't of God. This weakness ain't of God. This, this foolishness is not of God. Yet God says, that foolishness is my wisdom and power. So the Corinthians have been saved a little while, so they think they're something. So they're acting like, well, you know, and Paul says, you know, the same wisdom of this world that rejected Jesus, that rejected Christ crucified, would reject you because you look weak and you look foolish and you look uh, bad and you, there's nothing to take pride in you. He's saying your very salvation stands on this wisdom of this weakness and this uh, the way that God is. Well, that should affect them. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That should affect them since they're going with these men who are going against that kind of wisdom and the only wisdom that will accept them is God's. <clears throat> In verse 31, the apostle then refers to the prophet Jeremiah to emphasize that even as the Jews of old rejected going into captivity in Babylon as a viable option which God would take, so also does the wisdom of this world concerning Christ crucified. It is the weak and foolish who are the only ones who, are truly, who will truly boast in the Lord. In the Lord there is Christ crucified. One day I'll give you what the Lord showed me on that. In verses 29 through 31, to boast in the Lord means that they are to only boast in the wisdom and power of God as seen at the cross, and not in men or any status those men may have before may have uh, before gained by means other than selfless giving and loss. Okay. When Paul says. He that glories, let him glory in the Lord. The word glory there is the word boast. And he says, if any man boast, let him boast in the Lord. He's talking about the wisdom of God in Christ crucified. That's the subject he just said. You see your calling, brethren, how not many, you, the same thing. You see your first calling unto salvation, uh, and, and the example of that was God in weakness. You see, you're calling, you're called in weakness and, you know, not many noble, not many wise, but the base things and the foolish things to confound the world, even you yourselves. And he says, therefore, if any man boast, let him boast in Christ crucified. And what was my wording there? Uh, and that means to boast in the wisdom and the power of God is seen in the cross, and not in men, and not any status that men may have before one another, or not any status that they may have gained by other means other than selfless giving. Don't boast in anything else is basically what he's saying. <laughs> he's saying don't boast in anything else. All right, let's see. All right, we're going to stop, and uh, we will come back. So take a little break.